So all of our presenters are here, so that's great. Thank you all for joining us and thank you all the participants, the attendees for uh, joining us as well. Um, and just a few housekeeping. Uh, this is a webinar, which is part of our uh, Southwest Research and Outreach Center Advancing Ag series. Uh, this is an educational series that includes monthly events that we're bringing together uh, with a diverse group of uh, researchers uh, and specialists. And we're trying to ad address crop production topics with multiple disciplines. Um, some of you might have watched the other two versions that we had, uh, but today we are focusing on uh, manure management. Uh, and then there have been quite a few questions that were submitted uh, before um, they started this talk already. So if you have more questions for our uh, panelist members, please submit them through the Q&A feature. Uh, you can all click on that uh, Q&A button and send in your questions, and then uh, we should be able to get them to our presenters. So today we have uh, three speakers. Uh, we have Christine Brown. She's a field crop sustainability specialist at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture. We have Glenn Arnold. He is an associate professor in manure management uh, specialist at the Ohio State University. And also Melissa Wilson, she's an assistant professor in uh, manure nutrient management specialist at the University of Minnesota. Um, I guess we're going to get started right away. Uh, Christine, who have you? You go first. And you are muted, Christine. Sorry there about that. Go. I thought I was unmuted. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. All right. So I feel really privileged to be presenting with, with Glenn and Melissa. Um, it is so neat to, to listen to some of the things that are happening in, in other parts of, of, the, of North America. So can you see my full screen? There, okay. So um, the topic is smart manure management. And I thought I would just go over just a, a quick um, overview and not touch on in crop application as much or cover crops, but looking at manure value and making the most of manure, it's, it's more than just equipment. I know farmers love equipment. They like testing new things, but application opportunities happen all year. And, and so there's things we can look at for crop rotations, for storage efficiencies, for looking at the 4R um, component of nutrient, nutrient management, nutrient distribution, reducing compaction, minimizing nutrient losses with things like nitrogen inhibitors, um, and, and then of course improving equipment and uh, looking at some of the new innovations, especially those that look at it at improved application uniformity. So manure management really is, is planning all year round for those opportunities of, of manure application, where it fits and when it fits. Hey, Christine, can you yeah. put your full screen on? It's showing us your speaker notes. Oh, it, well, that's weird. Go up to your display settings, and I think you have to do. OK, sorry about that. Yeah, you really don't want to see my speaker notes. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. OK. That's it. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and then the, the, the next thing is valuing the resource. So for a lot of people, manure is just one of those things. I got to get rid of it. Um, whenever it fits best, that's when I'm going to do it. But sometimes you, you look at, okay, what is manure worth? If I look at, for example, in this case, I'm looking at liquid finisher manure, one year open liquid manure pit, which is about a million, 1.13 million gallons imperial or, or one point almost four US gallons. So at capacity, that's worth a lot of money if it's if if you look at the urea the map and the the uh, potash value of that manure and so you look at okay how would how would i manage these nutrients if they were purchased at egg retail and I, am i managing those manure nutrients in the same manner or in in at least a manner where where uh, i'm making maximum use even though i have to maybe make some some compromises based on timing and and other field work and then the other question that comes into to place is where I'm applying this manure, do those fields even really need the nutrients? 
and and sometimes uh, we we would be farther ahead if we sold that manure to to a neighbor. And so I'm going to talk about that in in a minute. Um, oops. And then the other thing is is looking at storage coverage. Um, I know that that lagoons are really hard to cover, but some of the storages in in Ontario are cement storages. And if I look at that same example with the finisher hogs and and uh, looking at the same storage with cover or the, the uncovered that gets the rainfall, then basically I'm spending a lot of money each year on spreading water. And at a cent and a half a gallon, that can work out in this example to over $4,000 in just spreading water. Well, how many years do I have a storage working for me? And how long would it take to pay for a cover? Or at least these are some of the considerations that would go into it. And then when I have a covered, covered storage, I also have more concentrated nutrients, so I'm um, being more efficient taking it to the fields and, and maximizing the, uh, the nutrients. So this is just a, an exercise in looking at, at how, much, how much water am I really transporting? Is there some economics in reducing that water? And, and it may be other strategies like um, uh, liquid solid separation or, or just covering the storage. And then can 4R nutrient management fit into a manure management plan? Some of the things that, that, that uh, we look at is how much manure is being produced, how much storage is available. Do we, do we have enough storage that we can store it for a whole year and, and apply it after wheat harvest, for example, or, or do we have to spread at different times? How many acres will the manure be applied to? What is my crop rotation that I have those opportunities? And then looking at timing using those 4R standards. So to me, the, the, the strategies to maximize those nutrients, right rate, so uniform application, frequent analysis, calibrating the equipment so that I'm applying what I actually think I'm applying and what I need, um, right application timing, can I apply into growing crops uh, in the spring into corn? Um, Glenn's going to talk about that. Um, after cereal harvest with a cover crop, after uh, forage harvest, after corn harvest in the fall. Um, where I can incorporate that manure. Um, right field, selecting the crop that needs those nutrients the most, selecting the field that has the right soil conditions for application. So it might be a sandier field if it's in the spring versus a, a heavier field after wheat harvest. Um, right placement, rapid, can I inject or can I incorporate to minimize the ammonia volatilization? Can I avoid deep concentrated placement to minimize movement below the root zone? And then I've added a right to the four R's, and that's right storage management, uh, ensuring that we have enough storage capacity to cover the non-growing season and uh, storage management that reduces nutrient loss. So covered or covered with straw or, or some other, other um, management. And then year round planning, where does application fit into my farm management? Can I maximize my crop rotation? And I know in, uh, I, was, I assume in, in in, uh, in the states that there's places with um, wheat and with alfalfa where you've got opportunities. But in Ontario, we've got a wide variety of dairy and hog and poultry operations all mixed together around farm cro uh, cropland. And so there's, there's quite a bit of manure that happens onto winter wheat fields in the spring. Uh, this time of year with freeze thaw, they'll put it on the, on the surface and let the freeze thaw incorporated a little bit. Um, there'll be some incorporation into wheat fields, uh, shallow injection, not much though. Um, most of it's gonna be uh, applied side dress into corn and Glenn's gonna talk about that. Um, in the picture on the bottom left, um, you see manure application right after forage harvest. Um, that happens, uh, I would say on the majority of farms in Ontario, dairy farms in Ontario where there's some manure spread after one of the harvests. Um, after wheat harvest with cover crops, is probably the biggest time window for, for manure application. And then after corn silage with a cover crop. So those are some of the opportunities. Something neat that I saw at the last manure expo we were at was irrigation drop hose for manure into standing corn. Um, haven't ever seen this working, but it sure seems like a pretty cool idea in areas where this equipment is available. Um, and then looking at compaction, and, and that's where uh, that's where something like this would cause a lot less compaction than than tractor and tanker traffic. 
but this is a study that was done by by Dr. Scott Shear at Ohio State University, and I really liked using this because he did a little bit of work, a lot of work on looking at what is the cost in yield of wheel traffic um, versus not wheel trafficked areas. And with manure application where he was using, I, I'm guessing it was a box spreader uh, with not very wide application with, he was getting 45% of the field was being trafficked. And where the soil conditions were normal and dry, there was a six bushel yield difference between the rest of the field and the wheel trafficked areas. But on wet soil conditions, it was a 27 bushel yield loss. So a 27 bushel yield loss on 45% of the field, if you look at um, $4.50 per bushel corn prices, that works out to a lot, of, a lot of yield loss that we're losing through compaction and it might not even be a one year thing. And so the question I wonder is, can we afford to put other crops that might not yield quite as much into that rotation to give us an opportunity for some cover crops and some, some manure? And of course that's not gonna work in every situation, but it's just one of those things to think about. And selling manure, taking manure from an area of high fertility to an area of low fertility. If I look at finisher manure and I look at after application um, value from that manure, $6 after application where I've already got high phosphorus and potassium levels versus hundred over $100 where I've got low uh, phosphorus and potassium levels. So I'm getting much more benefit from those manure nutrients if I sell it to a neighboring farm and get the cash up front. Um, and that can be done through, through trading straw or through trading fields. But the whole idea of moving manure from areas where the fields need the nutrients versus building the fertility levels is, is gonna be a win-win. And it takes, so it takes years to see payback on P and K levels in fields that already have high, high fertility levels in soils. And that can be done um, cooperatively with livestock cash crop farms. Generally looks, works better when there's third party consultant helping with the paperwork. But I think it also provides some opportunities for shared storages for pipelines that go to a central location where you can attach to a drag hose and cover a, a, a bigger uh, central location, a bigger, bigger land mass. And it also helps decrease transportation costs and reduces some of the road issues associated with, with truck traffic and tanker traffic. Variable rate um, opportunities, uh, new technology like Harvest Lab 3000 for, for sensor application, um, opportunity to skim manures so that we've got the high nitrogen, low phosphorus close to the storage and the more nutrient rich materials can be moved further from the storage. Um, site specific, usually site specific for manure application, it's usually based on phosphorus. And then the other opportunity, strip till manure application, as we get more um, interest in, in strip till, in leaving residue, um, we can reduce soil stir disturbance, but increase the, the nutrients applied in the fall, plant right into it in the spring, either through, through pre-incorporated um, manure into the strips or bio strips where we've got cover crops. Um, with, the, with the availability of GPS systems, um, going into straight rows is a little bit easier. And it also potentially gives us the opportunity to use nitrogen inhibitors. And in nitrogen inhibitors, I think uh, there's opportunities here that we still need to learn more about. The trouble with the nitrogen inhibitors so far from what we can tell from reducing the ammonium conversion to nitrate tends to be we get some warm periods during the winter months and the nitrogen inhibitors, inhibitors stop working. Um, so it, it uh, still makes us lose some of that nitrogen ahead of when the corn crop could use it. Oops. And then I'm this just a transition into to Glenn's topic about applying manure into standing crops, and then just uh, free advertising, I guess. Uh, manure Expo uh, was supposed to happen last year. We're planning it, probably quite a bit of it virtually for August the 25th and 26th. So I will turn it over to Glenn. All right, hold on, Glenn. Uh, before we transition, I got a couple questions here I can uh, ask you, Christine, right away. So we at least get you some questions before uh, it's all over. 
Uh, first, Jerome Lansing, uh, thanks you for uh, converting all the numbers to US. So that, that's very nice. So you don't have to guess what they transition to. Um, so you talk, uh, some of the questions we have here, uh, Christine, is one of them is, what is your view on winter manure application on frozen soils and how that relates to uh, potential water quality issues? Yeah, so um, we are really, really uh, against winter application. Um, we have a peer-to-peer -peer committee in Ontario where um, when manure application is reported, um, the commodity groups go out to those farms and try and determine why that manure is being applied. Um, we, we don't want to see regulations per se, because sometimes there's opportunities in, in uh, late December or early January where sometimes you can incorporate that manure and, and that might be a best scenario. But on snow covered or frozen ground, there's just too much loss. And from a farmer's perspective, you're not putting, if, if you were paying for commercial fertilizer to be applied on a field, you would not be happy with the retailer if most of those nutrients were at the bottom of the hill or in the water course. So why would we apply manure in those kind of conditions? And even solid manure that's heavily bedded, if we look at liquid loading, um, where 5,000 gallons is basically on heavy clay, the, the uh, amount where manure starts to run off, um, Frozen soil means it's all clay, which means that any nutrients mixed with, with a quarter inch of rain is, is going to move. And so winter application, uh, don't do it. Let's look for opportunities that we can improve in crop application. Great, thank you. Another question that we have been, that was submitted is, what, if any, water quality monitoring systems are available to check groundwater, if you know? Uh, probably <laughs> in Ontario, where most of the fields are, are tile drained, I'm going to say measuring what comes out of the tiles is probably a good indicator of what's moving below the root zone. Um, what makes it to the groundwater is a little bit harder. Um, there has been studies done, but I, I'm not, I'm not well enough versed to talk about it at, at on a webinar. Um, but I think where there's a lot of tile drainage, we can get a pretty good indication of nutrient moving through the soil profile just by what's coming out of the tiles. All right, and I'll ask you one more question here and then we'll transition to Glenn. Uh, how can manure be getting, well, it's actually a follow-up to what you're just talking now. How can manure be getting into tile drainage systems and what can be done to avoid these issues? Yeah, so, so, um, in Ontario, the research that's been done, um, nutrients can get into tiles um, through earthworm channels, root channels, cracks in heavy clay soils. But if we've got high phosphorus fertility levels, and the research is indicating um, 30 parts per million, which for, that's an Olson test. So for Bray, that would probably be somewhere around 50 or 60. Um, we start getting less uh, of the phosphorus being held on to the soil particles and more of it moving through matrix flow. Uh, nitrogen's a whole different story. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg for nitrogen that moves um, through the soil um, during the non-growing season. All right, thank you, Christine. Uh, Glenn, I'll hand it to you now. Okay, I'll see if I can do my screen share. Everyone able to see my full screen? Yes, works good. Okay, great. I'm pleased to be here. I'm Glenn Arnold. I work for Ohio State. I do a lot of work with uh, manure option or manure work uh, all around uh, Western Ohio, Northwest Ohio, primarily. I'm going to talk a little bit about enhancing um, the nitrogen content of manure, and then move into why we would want to enhance the nitrogen content of manure. I work in an the Western Lake Erie Basin uh, watershed. I live right in the center of it. And up on the right hand corner is Lake Erie. And starting about 2011, these are the algae issues we've dealt with in Saint, Saint, uh, or in Lake Erie. Toledo is down here in the far left corner. And this area would be the Western basin of the lake. 
and it's caused a lot of issues. And then in 2011, when it was really bad, the wind blew the algae over around Cleveland. So it interfered with water intakes there, water intakes at Toledo. And then 2014, Toledo had to shut down their water intake to about a half a million people for about 56 hours. So certainly puts a lot of political pressure on everyone. I'm gonna primarily work with liquid manure. And this is kind of how manure samples are analyzed in our state of Ohio. Um, my first number I'm looking at, and these are in pounds in 1000 gallons. And this is 37.68 total pounds of nitrogen. Of that in hog manure, almost all is in the ammonium form. I like that because it's readily available to crops. It's readily available to be utilized. There's a small amount of organic nitrogen. Had this been a dairy manure test, organic nitrogen is going to be a lot higher and ammonium nitrogen a lot lower. For our arguments today, though, we also look at P2O5 and K2O. What I like to have when we enhance manure is I like to make it fit whatever I want to use it for. So in this instance, I'm going to tell you that oftentimes I want a two to one ratio of two parts nitrogen in the ammonium form for every one part of P2O5. Because if I need to put 200 units of nitrogen on a corn crop for a side dress, then that means I'm putting about 100 units of P2O5 as a side dress. And that's what we normally will consume over a two-year corn soybean rotation in Ohio. It's somewhere around 100 pounds of P2O5, maybe as much as 120 pounds. But we don't want to make the side dress work we do uh, contribute uh, to the growth of P2O5 levels in our soil. The other point. Christine had mentioned wanting to sell uh, nutrients, manure nutrients to your neighbors. Oftentimes, at least 40%, maybe upwards of 50% of the N, P, and K in swine manure, especially, is in the nitrogen form, the ammonium nitrogen form. So when you sell that to a neighbor in the fall, um, that neighbor's probably not going to realize much value out of that uh, nitrogen co component that's there. He'll get some the following year, but not near as much as if we could actually put that on a growing crop. As much as I enjoy working with swine manure, we also work a lot with dairy and dairy manure because of the outside storage and the rainwater and the flushing water from the milk parlors and runoff from the lots. You know, that's not going to be near as concentrated as our hog manure. And then, of course, uh, nursery manure is not as concentrated as swine finishing manure would be. So these are just a couple studies that I did early on. Now, here we decided we were going to take nursery manure and we were going to enhance it with um, nitrogen to bring the, the level of the uh, nitrogen up in the nursery manure. We were doing that because these were on-farm plots and the total amount of, of manure that we could apply per acre and get all the way to the end of the field was 6,000 gallons. So we basically figured out how much 28% UAN, urea ammonium nitrate, we needed to get the proper nitrogen rate that we wanted. And this slide kind of summarizes what we did. We took uh, 30 gallons of 28% UAN, and we added that to a 5,000 gallon manure tanker, understanding that you never really get 5,250 gallons in the manure tanker. And then we wanted to use that for side dress. So before the nitrogen was added, as we pulled the manure out of the pit, these were the average of several samples we took. And that swine manure, that nursery manure, had a, just, just short of 10 pounds of available nitrogen in 1,000 gallons. And then once we dumped the 28 in and kept it agitated, we bumped that up to about 25 pounds of usable nitrogen per 1,000 gallons. Didn't really do anything with the P2O5 or K2O. They were similar. But when we put our 6,000 gallons per acre of manure on the field, uh, had we not enhanced it, we would have put less than 60 pounds of nitrogen. When we did enhance it, we put a, just almost 150 pounds of nitrogen. And that was the farmer's goal, was to have 150 pounds of side dress nitrogen. Another year, we worked with some dairy farms doing something similar. At one point, we were filling five gallon buckets and we were climbing up this ladder and we were dumping them in. And then the, uh, we got the bright idea, we would just time how long it took to get the necessary amount of nitrogen we needed out of that 28 tank. And so during the manure application fill process, we simply supplemented the nitrogen in. Always remember if you ever do this, that 
28% is much more dense than manure. You know, 28% is probably about 10.2 pounds per gallon, whereas manure is going to be closer to eight. So understand that they will separate if there's not some agitation, not some bumping around, which is never really a shortage of that when you're working with manure tankers, of course. But in that instance, again, we, we sampled the manure ahead of time, and then we pulled samples from the applicator as we were going down through the field. So we bumped it from 12.9 pounds of available nitrogen to 29.9 pounds. And then when we were limited to our 6,000 gallons, again, because of our equipment we were using, we went from applying 77 pounds of nitrogen per acre to 179. And his target was to get 180. So it's not really too difficult to do that. You know that UAN has about three pounds per gallon. If you know how short you're gonna be of nitrogen, you just add the, the necessary UAN. And that could be added a lot of ways. If we're using frack tanks, it could be added at that point. If we're using uh, semis, it could be added during the loading of semis. There's ways that we could add that if we felt like we needed to. Now, if I'm not limited by my equipment, of course, I could always up my mineral application rate as well, as long as my P205 falls into line to where I want it to be. Now, why would we enhance manure? Well, mainly because we use it as a top dress for wheat and a side dress for corn. This was an early plot, and this was just a few days ago where um, one of our sow units was able to uh, get out and apply sow manure. So he's applying sow manure at 10,000 gallons per acre on top of wheat in the month of March. And uh, he knew precisely the, the pounds of nitrogen. He's gonna get 120 pounds of nitrogen out of this manure application. And that'll be sufficient to raise a very good crop of uh, soft red winter wheat here in Ohio. In addition to using it on wheat, we have also spent a lot of years working with manure application to corn. This is my university tanker. You can see we took the flotation tires off. They, these are on 10 foot centers. So they follow the outer row of the tractor down through the cornfield, have a lot of freedom to go to corn height as tall as the tractor can get through. And this is just an example of where we're using a six row applicator. And there's some compaction concerns certainly when you use a tanker on, uh, on fields in May or June. But there's, a, again, a lot of opportunities and in the organic industry has really jumped on this whole idea and are realizing that uh, these neighbors they have as swine producers are gold mines if they can make that all go, or go right. The next step after using it in tankers was to use drag hoses. Ohio State has three of these 12 row drag hose units and we work with commercial manure applicators and farmers. And this is essentially a cornfield in the V3 stage, kind of hard to see at times, but um, we're side dressing with about 5,000 gallons per acre of swine finishing manure. And these are colder till units. We've done this also with dairy manure up to rates of 12 or 13,000 gallons per acre. It's hard to get it covered very well once you get above seven or 8,000 gallons with colder till units. But again, we just put the large drag hoses out in the field. We can flatten corn and get, get uh, pretty good results. Sometimes we plant the fields at a 45 degree angle to make it easy for the drag hose person. One piece of equipment in the field at a time can do the entire field if the, if the uh, corn's planted at an angle. Other times we involve a hose humper as we have in this instance. And essentially we can go up to corn as at the V4 stage, but not the V5. And this is V3 corn because we have a collar here on this leaf, a collar here on this leaf, and a collar on that leaf. So this is V3 corn, but we, and we can tolerate a collar on that, that leaf itself, but we can't go to V5. If you really have a question on that, it's easiest just to step on that plant. If it snaps off, it's probably too tall, too advanced. If it just bends over, the field will tolerate the drag hose. So we're just trying to do uh, what Christine's doing, right nutrient, right place, right time, and a right amount. And we're trying to do this to, um, because we encourage the commercial fertilizer people to do it. We can do the same thing, I think, in the manure industry. If you like Facebook, you can follow a lot of my work. Uh, I post a lot of our videos and, and research results uh, on here, in addition to writing them up in journals and stuff at Ohio State Extension Environmental and Manure Management. And with that, I think I got it in on my 10 minute time limit. So I will 
do whatever you want to do. Take questions or. All right, Glenn. Yes, uh, there are two questions here. Let me ask you a couple before we uh, we go to Melissa. Okay. Uh, all right. So, first question here. You you mentioned you you briefly discussed it. Um, about manure segregation in a tank. And the question is, do you see much of that happening and what you can do to avoid the issues? And have you tried um, any other types of uh, liquid uh, fertilizers addition to manure as well? No, we only used 28 so far because that, that's a liquid and it was handy and, and close by us. And that's kind of our standard um, here in my part of Ohio. The um, segregation of those, I've not had a problem with uh, at all with it because we're adding during the loading process. But if a tanker sat idle, sat still for a few hours, I could see where the 28 would move to the bottom of the tanker. And most of these are bottom fills. So they that would go out first before the rest of the manure in the tanker did. So that's my only, I just thought I'd point that out because somebody surely is going to jump, jump on that concern. <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, another one here. Um, so you sh just showed some of the the ways to do the application on standing crops. So what do you see most of the benefits are, and what are potential uh, detrimental effects of applying manure on standing crops? Well, the positives are you're going to capture that nitrogen. So we can we can apply around six thousand gallons per acre of swine finishing manure and completely replace the purchased side dress nitrogen that you were going to buy and apply to that field anyhow. As Christine said, most livestock producers aren't too excited about buying manure from somebody else because they generally have enough P and K in their fields. The only other two aspects of, of manure that would appeal to most farmers are the nitrogen content and the moisture. On a dry year, when we side dress like that, it's not unusual to see a 25 bushel difference easily and uh, where manure was applied versus commercial fertilizer, just because of the moisture and a bit of the tillage, I think. So you know, those are the positives. The other neat thing is a lot of companies are looking at that and they are developing better equipment. Uh, Cadman has a side dress system that they're gonna let us work with this year that has a hard hose. And we think that's got a bright, bright future in this side dress industry. So I think as the businesses, as industry creates equipment to meet this need i think the options are really going to expand for everybody great and i didn't mention when we started the seminar i mentioned before but i think there were too few guests that had it, um, logged in uh, so if you want to submit a question uh, you can click on the q a button um, and then you can submit your questions that way and we can you can ask the participants at the end of their talk and there'll probably be time at the end that we can also have any uh, left burning questions that we want to ask. We can ask the participants. Um, I'll get you one more here, Glenn, before we go to Melissa. Uh, Real-time technology to analyze manure per load at the barn level. Do you know of any of these technologies? At the barn level. Um, we worked last year with John Deere's new sensor. And that sensor fits right inside the uh, stinger on the drag hose system. And uh, I listened to a presentation yesterday out of Iowa State where uh, Puck uh, Enterprises talked about their use of the stinger of, of the John Deere sensor. So John Deere's got one and Topcon's got one. And, um, you know, again, it's relatively new or everybody's learning. But I think that those, they'll refine those sensors over a short few years of time that you know we'll be able to get instant readings from what the NP and K is and the manure as it as its field applied. We had a student last summer who pulled um, manure samples from the tube every 20 minutes as we applied over the course of several days and so he's compared that to the sensor and uh, generally the numbers fluctuate together as they should and the sensor's not maybe dialed in as tightly as the samples were, but still it's given everybody a pretty good idea of what is coming out of it. So we'll, we're gonna do that again this summer. That'll give us two years of data. And the other thing we wanna find out is how consistent is the nitrogen over the course of the day when you're pumping out of a pit or a manure pond. And the nitrogen st stays much more consistent than the phosphorus does. 
And as most people would guess, if, I, if it's not been stirred up in advance, the phosphorus gets a lot thicker toward the bottom of the manure storage unit than the top. So for the most part, uh, I think there's a lot of neat technology coming in that area. But you know, we could all start with the basics by pulling manure samples during the loading process and, and really having an understanding of what's in your manure because it's gonna be pretty consistent from year to year out of a storage container, but every farm's a little bit different. So, you know, I cannot just use somebody else's manure test when I go to a farm and side dress corn. We, we need to know what, what's coming out of that particular manure pit. All right, great, Glenn. So there is a question that just came in. I think it's more of an open question. It could be for any of you three. I'll ask this one and then whoever is done answering them, Melissa, you can take over. So is there an effort to transition land grants fields and replicated trials from low residue tillage and planting systems to low impact manure, strip tillage and low till? I think from my experience, it all depends on, on uh, who your person that's conducting research is, you know, as we, as we, as you hire new faculty in at universities, they're going to have different interests and different things that they want to do compared to somebody who was hired in 30 years ago. So, you know, I, speaking for Ohio State, when, when you bring in young faculty, they have, they have much more, much more interesting things that they want to conduct research on than what some of us older people do. So, you know, I think, again, it comes back to what universities hire, what the, what the dean selects as their final candidate during interview processes. Yeah, I agree at Minnesota, there are people who are conducting some of this research. It certainly would be interesting if we had some of our bulk fields where we're not necessarily doing replicated research, but growing crops for you know, the animals or whatever that are on the research stations. If some of those are moving into that as well. In Ontario, we've got a, a unique program that just started last year. And there's been, um, there's a, a, a farm group, it's called the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. So it's every county has an association and then there's regional associations and they work with the, the uh, staff at the soil and crop, work with the university staff. And, and so they've initiated some, um, I think there's, I forget how many, there's about 20, I think, 20 or 25 um, on farm trials and the majority of them are, are including organic amendments of some sort. Um, majority of them are also including cover crops. And so this is real time in field research where the farmers are saying to the researchers, this is what we wanna find out. And they're working together to, to do some of that research. And it's kind of similar to the discovery farms, only not quite as in depth. Okay, Melissa, we will help you uh, get started. You are still muted. Can you see my screen okay? Oh, yes, looks I great. Don't, I don't know why I did that. All right. So one of the things I wanna talk a little bit today is some of the research that we're doing here in Minnesota on cover crops and trying to integrate you know, fall cover crops with fall manure application. Because traditionally you, we recommend that you get your manure on later fall because that's when soil temperatures are cool. We're less likely to reduce or to, we're less likely to lose some of the nutrients that might be lost if the soil temperatures are warm due to microbial transformations in the soil of nitrogen especially. But on the other hand, you want to get your cover crops grown as early as possible to give them as much time to grow, especially in our cold conditions. So how do we do that without killing our cover crop when we want to apply manure later in the fall? So we're looking into some of this. So first up, I just want to give you a brief um, background on one of the studies that was done. I was coming on board in mid-2017, so I kind of got in on the tail end of this project. But this was done at 19 on-farm sites across Minnesota over two years, 2016 and 2017. And they basically tried to incorporate or inject manure beneath a cover crop. 
that was already grown. And in this case, the cover crop was always drilled after harvest of either silage corn or soybean. And then you can see we did a bunch of different manure types, whether it was dairy or swine manure. So that then dictates kind of what, what crop rotation we're looking at, whether it was continuous corn or corn silage, corn soybean rotation. Some of the big things that we learned from this though are that the type of equipment really matters when you're trying to integrate the manure into a cover crop. Here we have some deep shanks that are a really aggressive tillage. They really rolled the soil as they were being pulled through it. And you can see that after injection in the fall, <laughs> the cover crop um, looked pretty sparse. It didn't look very good, unfortunately. And then coming back in the spring, you know, from far away, you could still see the strips where the cover crops had been applied. But when you looked up close, um, there was, it was pretty spotty. So in one hand, the rye cover crop in this case did really well in coming back from kind of poor conditions. So it's pretty hardy. But on the other hand, we're you know, typically looking for a little better coverage than this to reduce soil erosion and to trap some of the nutrients that might have been applied from the manure. Another popular application method here in Minnesota is the double discs. This is sometimes called an injection, but it's really more of a surface application with immediate incorporation where the soil is thrown on top of the bands of manure that are applied. And as you can imagine, between these two concave discs, it's pretty aggressive. And that's what we see here is that the cover crop was um, pretty torn up. But between the discs, you can see these cover crops still remained. So this is what it looked like then in the spring, where it was still pretty aggressive and a little sparse between where those concave discs rolled. But in between the strips, it looked pretty good. So in this case, it's really, you know, what are you looking for in a cover crop? Are you trying to get as much coverage as possible? Are you just trying to reduce wind erosion? So this may be okay for your needs, it may not be, but I wanted to show you what that looks like. Best case scenario, it looked a little rough during application, but in a lot of the farms where they did like a knife injection or even if they had sweeps, but like non-aggressive sweeps, sweeps that just kind of lifted up the soil and set it back down rather than rolling the soil off of the top of it. Those seem to be kind of the best case scenarios. So here we have two weeks after injection. This is the same field that we see here. You can see the um, same power line here in the background. It looked pretty good actually afterwards, even in the fall. And then in the spring, we had really good cover crop biomass. I think this one ended up being somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds of biomass above ground biomass per acre. So these are some of the big things that we learned from this study. Um, we know that we can get a cover crop established after harvest that will grow into the spring if you're doing winter rye. We did find that it trapped nutrients uh, there was about a 75 pound difference between these strips where there was cover crops and where there wasn't cover crops in uh, the spring where there was less nutrients where there was cover crops, meaning that those nutrients were being held in the actual cover crop itself. And then we did not see any differences in yield on average across all 19 sites. There were some differences within sites, some places the cover crops actually improved yields and some places the cover crops decreased yields but the overall average was about a draw. So it was pretty successful, but one of the things we learned is that the cover crops, especially if they got planted later and later on the farms, were really, really small. So the next kind of phase of the research was to look at, can we get the cover crops established earlier to try to trap more of the nutrients? So we're doing these at two research station sites across Minnesota and two on-farm fields. And a couple of different rotations, we're looking at sweet corn, drilling after sweet corn, and then going into corn. We're looking at drilling or interseeding in corn early summer, interseeding late summer, and then drilling after silage corn, and then seeing how that impacts the next year's silage corn. We're looking at a soybean corn rotation where we interseeded around leaf drop, and we compared that to drilled after harvest. And then again, looking at the corn after that. And we also have a bunch of on-farm um, strip till studies where the farmers actually have implements where they are putting the manure into the same strip where they have their strip till implement. So then they're going back and planting in those rows the next spring, which has been really, really interesting. 
one of the big things we wanted to test besides the cover crops, which I kind of talked a little bit about already, we looked at cover crop timing. We also had no cover crop controls just to see how the cover crop compared without a cover crop. But we also wanted to look at nutrient source timing. Our standard practice we considered to be spring fertilizer. So we applied all the nitrogen needs, for instance, or phosphorus all in the spring. But fall manure was applied. And in the case where we could get it on early, like after a silage corn or after the sweet corn, we did an early manure application when soil temperatures were still warm, so above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And we did a late manure application where the soil temperatures were already cool. And we wanted to see, you know, with and without cover crops, if the cover crops are there, can they help trap some, some of those nutrients if we do a manure application that's before the ideal conditions or soil temperatures are cool? So the idea was, could we use cover crops to mitigate losses if we wanted to apply manure early? And then we had a combination of all of these things. So we had plots where there was interseeded cover crops, early manure, interseeded late manure, interseeded spring fertilizer, et cetera. So we could kind of see you know, all of these different combinations of factors. How did that pan out on yield? And how did that pan out on soil health? That is something we're also measuring in this study. So learning from our previous study, we did choose to go with a sweep injection because we were doing dairy and liquid swine manure and we knew we wanted to be able to open up that pocket of soil so that especially with the dairy manure, which has a higher application rate, we could try to keep that incorporated better. And in this conditions, it was a little wet in this particular field. So you can see that there were some clods being brought up, but there's lots of room between where we're applying the manure. And this is on uh, 30 inch centers. So we're applying every 30 inches here. Um, you still see a lot of cover crop between where the manure was being applied. So just to quick summarize what we've found so far, we did look at the cover crop impacts on yield. There was no effect for the winter killed covers if we used oats. In that case, we did not see any yield impacts on the following corn. We did see that winter rye reduced yield following sweet corn. We think some of this is because, you know, that cover crop was very robust in the spring. And we think there might have been some nitrogen tie up from the large cover crop biomass. We got around 1,000 pounds per acre, a little less, depending on the um, seeding when it got seeded. But we think there could have been some nitrogen tie up. We are doing collecting soil samples. We have collected them. We're just working on getting those analyzed this year to see if we can see differences in nitrogen availability. But in the soybean or silage corn rotation, we did not see an impact of that winter rye. So in those cases, the winter rye didn't seem to impact the yield, though the biomass was a lot lower. That was probably only 400 pounds per acre or less of spring biomass. So we think that that nitrogen tie up may have been an issue, but we're still looking into that. The other thing that we're looking at, you remember, is that uh, nutrient source timing. So we compared most things to the traditional practice spring fertilizer. We found that when in the one study, which was sweet corn going into corn, we were able to get that early applied manure in September. And we did find that that reduced corn yields the next year. I think our late manure application was about 265 bushels per acre. And our late manure application was closer to 200, if I'm remembering my numbers correctly. Um, but it was a significant loss in yield uh, for those for that early manure application. Now, if we did the early manure application in October, which we did these about two weeks apart because this was fall of 2019. And if you remember fall of 2019, it barely stopped raining. So we had to dodge rain events. So our early manure application that happened in silage corn happened in early October. So it was a, still a few weeks before the temperatures got cool, but it wasn't quite as long before temperatures got cool as that September application. So in that case, we found that the early application in October did not impact corn yield the following year for the silage corn system. And the late application of manure was similar to, or in most cases, or in some cases, actually better than the spring fertilizer. And um, this was kind of an interesting find for us. 
we don't know what was going on, like why that happened specifically, because we haven't been able to look at our soil tests yet. We think it could be due to the micronutrients and secondary nutrients provided by the manure. Because that fall had been really wet, we don't know if those had been less available and maybe the corn crop just needed more of it than it traditionally would in a normal year. So uh, we are pretty pleased to see that that late manure application did so well. But of course, this is only one year. We are repeating it for the second year. We just got fall manure applied this past fall and we'll apply fertilizer this spring where needed and try it again and just see if we get similar results or if it's you know, something completely different. So far it's, I mean, it's very wet out today here in Minnesota, but it's been pretty dry so far this year. So we'll see if it kind of continues and is different than the first year that we did this. So just wanna thank our sponsors for this research, the Minnesota Research Corn, Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council, as well as the USDA and RCS are supporting this research. And if you wanna follow me, I'm not on Facebook, but I am on Twitter, follow me at Prof or our manure extension team is UMN Manure. But with that, I think I'm ready for some questions, Paulo. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Um, I'll start with one that Mark uh, Kronenbosch sent. Uh, Lewiston, Minnesota has a low impact knife system, Bonanza. The depth of manure injection is shallow. Have you measured CO2 gas off by depth of manure injection? Thank you all for your great work, Melissa. Thanks. No, I haven't actually measured CO2 off gassing. We are looking at ammonia losses in some studies, but I don't have the equipment. My, my team doesn't have the equipment to do CO2 gas, but we do have some other faculty that do that kind of work. So that would be really interesting to look at. Thanks for that idea. Okay. I got a couple more questions for you. Um, are there potential losses of nutrients if manure is applied on standing crops as opposed to injected? It's like surface applied in standing crops? I assume, yes. If we're talking about standing crops in the summer, absolutely. Those warm and usually in the summer dry conditions tend to drive ammonia losses when manure is on the soil surface. Even in fall, when it's starting to cool down, we see a large amount of ammonia losses when soil is on the surface. So I'm you know, a bit biased because I am a nutrient specialist and that incorporation helps reduce the nutrient losses. I realize there's offsets if you're trying to do no-till and things like that, but from a nutrient standpoint, surface applied manure does tend to lose more nitrogen, especially than injected or incorporated manure. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question for you, um, how much nitrogen can I expect to see in years after the manure has been applied? Maybe second or third year, I'm assuming here? It depends on the manure type. We certainly tend to see a little more from the dairies and the beef manures the second year because uh, kind of Glenn pointed out that there is that organic fraction and it's bigger in manure when we're talking about the ruminants, so the cattle. So we see a bigger credit the second year. Usually something like swine um, has less of a second year credit. I think in Minnesota, we estimate about 15% will be available the second year of that total nitrogen amount that was applied in the first year. I can't remember. I think the dairy and beef are 25% and poultry is a little higher too because poultry is one of those things that just has so much nitrogen that even though a lot of it's in the organic form, even if a fraction's releasing the first year, it's still a large, a large uh, fraction. So I think that one is 25 to 30% too off the top of my head, but check out the University of Minnesota's extension site. If you're in Minnesota, a lot of other areas, I'm sure including Canada, up where Christine's from, have recommendations from some of the universities who have tried to look at this. Great, thank you, Melissa. Um, another one here, um, did you compare early September manure um, application on fields that had cover crop and a field that did not? If so, was there a difference in yield also? Yes, we did. So in our studies, these were all um, small plots. We had some issues with the wet conditions and some of our on-farm stuff, unfortunately. The cover crop was very tiny. So in our, on, in our 
on small plots, we did have with and without cover crops, with and without manure, and compared to the with and without cover crops with spring fertilizer. In that case, the with and without cover crops didn't seem to matter. In the sweet corn where we applied the manure early in September, we saw the same trend where yields were reduced regardless of if there was a cover crop or not. We know that the cover crop obviously took up nutrients because we can measure that. And we actually just yesterday got the results back from some of the nutrient analyses of the cover crop, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. Uh, but we think that there is still such a large proportion of it that the cover crop couldn't even take up that was probably lost. And again, remember that was a really wet year too. So if it was in the nitrate form and the plant couldn't take it up fast enough, it was wet enough that it was probably lost. Great, thank you, Melissa. Now I have a couple of questions that are pretty much open-ended. Um, you all can answer. Uh, thank you for the presentations today. When dealing with fields that have a history of liquid manure application, we do need to account for higher nitrogen mineralization when we estimate the additional N needed for the crop. What are the, what do the three of you think are the best approaches to estimate the nitrogen mineralization from liquid manure applied in previous years? That's definitely, definitely true that there is going to be a nitrogen credit that has to be figured out. Probably the easiest and simplest way on corn is to do a, a pre-nitrate or pre-side dress nitrate test to see what comes back. Um, how many parts per million of nitrate and nitrogen are in the soil and ready to go. But I know in my plot work that I've done, because most of our, what we do is on farm with farmers, um, it doesn't take near as much nitrogen to grow a corn crop as you think in fields that have, have a history of manure. So we don't really have a good system for calculating that, uh, but, but it's, it's definitely there. I was going to say in Minnesota, if, if you applied manure last fall, then we wouldn't recommend using uh, the spring pre-plant nitrate test because that um, isn't calibrated for like a last fall manure application. But if it was two years ago or more, our spring nitrate tests um, can be helpful to determine what nitrogen is actually in your soil right before planting. All right. Yeah, one in, more. Ontario, in Ontario, Go it's uh, similar. We, we give a nitrogen credit based on organic nitrogen levels um, from previous manure applications. What we found though is where you've got farms that have a history of, of manure application, the organic matter levels in the soil are higher. And as long as there isn't compacted layer, um, you tend to get better uh, nutrient cycling. And I think that's part of what Glenn was just talking about where you always uh, get higher yields and less nitrogen to get those yields. Um, we have a couple more minutes. I just want to make an announcement. Uh, Emily has sent a link for you that attended to give us your feedback about the webinar. So if you could please hit that link and let us know how we're doing and what we need to do to make this better for you. Uh, I'll go back to the question here. There's only two more that I wanted to address. Um, question for our speakers. Related to real time and sensor development, is anyone developing or is there promise in developing variable rate manure application technology? And how readily available are side dress manure application equipment to producers? Well, I'll, I'm gonna, if I may, I may, I'll make a couple comments about the variable rate technology. We have uh, several farmers in Ohio who are already using that. Um, Dwayne Statler would be one that lives uh, in, in near Finley, Ohio. And he basically has a system where they have their fields uh, grid tested, and then when he runs across the uh, field with his tanker, um, the hydraulic pump speeds up and slows down the tanker pump to add or, or reduce the amount of uh, phosphorus that they're applying to the field. So they're trying to even out their low spots of phosphorus and, and avoid adding to their high spots of phosphorus using that technology. And then there's another farmer over in Wayne County that um, he's got a system that speeds up and slows down his tractor to accomplish the same thing. So as you're going across the field, it basically will just automatically speed up the tractor or slow down. So there, that technology is coming. John Deere has been working on it. Others have been working on it. Um, you know, it's just a matter of whether you can save enough and make it work in a way that it's going to be, you know, financially make sense for you. Mm -hmm. 
like Glenn said, it's it's really the phosphorus that determines the application rate. And so there's a few farmers in Ontario that are looking at adding a second tank with nitrogen and doing what Glenn was talking about with mixing the nitrogen and the, the manure, only applying the, the nitrogen in addition to the manure at the variable rate for phosphorus. I haven't seen it working yet, but they're talking about it. That's really interesting, the second tank. I know we have a farmer here who's doing a old school applicate or old school variable rate where we're trying to figure out a test where he can measure the phosphorus for each load and it involves filtering manure. It's a dirty test, but it actually seems to be maybe working. And he's applying at the phosphorus based rate for each tank of manure because like um, I think we both talked about like as you empty a pit, the phosphorus levels change. So he's doing the old school method and then going back and side dressing with nitrogen to try to even off the nitrogen amounts. All right, I'm going to jump in and, and cut the conversation because we are one minute after our deadline. So I'd like to thank our panelists and all the participants that joined us today. At one point we had, I think, uh, 55 people in the webinar. So that's a great attendance. I thank everyone for attending. Uh, our next our next ROC, uh, next Advancing Ag webinar is going to be April 28th. Uh, a new future discussion on benefits of cover crops in regions with limited growing conditions. So, uh, Mark, you had a very good question on um, cover crop. You can email Melissa if you want to. Otherwise, you should attend the webinar on the 28th because you'll be covering uh, what you want to know. Uh, if you want to know more information about our future Advancing Ag series, you can um, hit the website z.umn.edu forward slash advancing dash ag. Uh, and with that, I thank everybody who attended and looking forward to our next series. Thank you, everyone.